Greetings and welcome to the second Origins Institute talk for the 2020-2021 academic year. My name is John Stone or Doc Rock and I'm the director for the Origins Institute and your host today. We're recording the proceedings and we will make the video available so that you can share it with your interested friends and colleagues. After the talk, we will hold a brief question and answer period. Please send your questions in the Q&A chat box. We will address as many questions as we can. Our alumni association members are bright, are as bright as stars actually, and already have posed many questions. So please rest assured, we'll try to follow up and provide re responses to any unanswered questions. Before formally introducing our guests, I'd like to relay some information about the Origins Institute. It is one among five research intensive centers and institutes in the Faculty of Science and 70 in total at McMaster University. These centers and institutes discover solutions to complicated challenges by bringing together interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and in our case, transdisciplinary teams. These teams collaborate, collaborate with academic, government, and industry partners, as well as you. We're collaborating at this very moment. Community outreach and engagement is a priority for all centers and institutes at McMaster University, which is why we host talks in collaboration with the McMaster Alumni Association. We, we continue to showcase our Origins Institute mandate with Colloquia this year, combining our prime research directive, astrobiology, with original institute themes. This week, the origin of elements. Please note that although Colloquia are slightly more specialized than our public lectures, our guest today has taken up the challenge to make accessible to a general audience the material in the colloquium. Professor Brad Gibson earned a master's degree and doctorate degree at the University of British Columbia which involved building the first liquid mirror telescope observatory and designing software to map the distribution of chemical elements throughout the universe. A Gruber Prize in Cosmology recipient as a member on a Hubble Space Telescope project where Professor Gibson used expand, exploding stars to determine the expansion rate of the universe. A National Geographic Magazine annual top 10 news story for being the first person to identify locations in the Milky Way most likely to harbor complex biological life. Currently is the director of the E.A. Milne Center for Astrophysics at the University of Hull, where over the past three years, Professor Gibson has been responsible for increasing the female contingent entering physics programs, doubling it quantitatively, more than doubling the program quali qualitatively. Brad also received uh, several awards for public outreach and engagement, and our, your attendance today will push cumulative audience members well beyond 1 million people, as Professor Gibson guides us toward answering the question, where are the aliens? Brad, welcome. Oh, thank you very much for that. I'm, it's gonna be very tough for me to, to live up to that introduction, but I certainly do appreciate it. Let's just see if I can, oops. I'm not sure if you're able to see the screen or not. Uh, not yet. Oh, something's coming up. Let's try that again because it, it said that it failed. So I'm going to try that again. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So thank you very much for that. I'll do my best to live up to it, as I said. Um, so my, it, it is a huge, huge pleasure for me. I'm sitting on the other side of the Atlantic right now at the, the University of Hull, and I'm going to spend a few minutes right at the beginning saying a little bit about where I work right now. Um, I am from Toronto though. Um, my mom lives just a few miles away from uh, McMaster University, so I do get back every once in a while. So it is a little bit of a homecoming. It's a real pleasure for me to actually address everyone at McMaster, including the, the alumni and then the current students. Uh, I really do appreciate the, the offer to come and talk to you. My background is more in computational astrophysics. Uh, the formation and evolution of the Milky Way, a little bit about the origin of the chemical elements and how they get distributed around uh, galaxies. And it was about 15 years ago I started to think about what could I use these simulations that I was working on to do something a little bit different than just talk about the structure of galaxies and the, the underpinning physics of, of galaxies. And so I, I did start to think a little bit about um, what are the conditions for life? I can't pretend to be a biologist or a chemist or a geologist. I am uh, an amateur on, on each of those, but I decided I would try to try to blend those in the way that the professionals have done it at the Origins Institute there at McMaster, but try to sort of dabble a little bit and, and take these simulations to wander around inside them, to look at where the conditions 
might be sort of at least conducive to the formation of complex biological life, as Jonathan was saying in, in his intro. Um, so it's not my full-time job working on this, but it has become very much a, a pet interest of, of what I'm working on. And I continue to dabble on it, and I'll talk about uh, a little bit about that as we, as we go along. Um, and I like that quote from, from Stephen, there's no bigger question in science than the search for, for extraterrestrial life. And so for me, while it's not my full-time job at trying to answer this question, it is one that uh, I have become increasingly passionate about over, over the years. Um, first, though, I did want to say a few words about where I'm sitting right now. Uh, I, as Jonathan said, I'm director of the E.A. Milne Center for Astrophysics. So one of the things I do like to point out, because it is a very common question, if I'm sitting on a plane and someone leans over my shoulder to see what's on the screen, uh, there is this confusion between E.A. Milne, Arthur Milne, the namesake of our center, and A.A. Milne, or Alan Milne, the creator of Winnie the Pooh, Christopher Robin, and, and co., um, similar in name, uh, different families do have some interesting overlaps in the sense that they were sort of contemporaries in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, they both had interesting backstories in the military with Alan Milne in, in the army and Arthur Milne, our namesake um, in the Navy. And I'll say just, you know, just a, a few little words about that. When I moved from, uh, I moved my group here about five years ago to the University of Hull, I looked up in Wikipedia just to, because I was curious, you know, if, were there any famous scientists that, that came from Hull? Uh, and for those in passing who know Hull, Hull is sort of part of the city of Gatineau and just across the border in, uh, across the border from Ottawa, just in, on the Quebec side. Uh, that's also named after the city I'm sitting in right now, uh, Hull. Um, Arthur Milne was born and raised in Hull. He was a contemporary of Einstein. Um, he had his own variants of relativity, let's say, um, with wildly incorrect maths, but elegant and beautiful maths as well. Um, he was much more grounded in sort of the Newtonian real world, world, if you like, and had problems wrapping his head around concepts of, of special and general relativity. Uh, he also worked quite a bit on the early development of models associated with stellar atmospheres and in particular how energy propagates from the centers of stars through the atmospheres and beyond. Um, during World War I, he, was, he wanted to serve in the Navy, but he had what we now would diagnose as early onset Parkinson's. And so he was seconded uh, into the uh, Naval Reserve with a group of other astrophysicists who were charged with uh, developing the first anti-aircraft gunnery technology with World War I being the first war that was fought in three dimensions and it wasn't just sort of scanning across the horizon for where you're supposed to fire your weapon uh, but you had to think about you know considering the south of England you had to worry about you know thick fog and cloud cover but trying to based around echolocation techniques zeppelins and planes coming in behind thick cloud or fog and feeding that information to, to gunners on the ground as quickly as as possible and he used his knowledge of stellar atmospheres applied to the earth's atmosphere and how sound propagates differently depending on altitude and temperature and, and humidity uh, it's one of the most decorated scientists one of the few you know in our um, astrophysical circles that we move in including a number of people at the origins institute uh, there's only you know, a dozen scientists who've won sort of the, the triple crown of astronomy medals from the Royal Society, the Astronomical Society of Pacific, and the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, so he had a, a very um, fantastic scientific history. Um, when I looked through the Wikipedia page for famous people from Hull, it's a very, very short entry. Um, but that name, Arthur Milne, stood out for me as I think back to my undergraduate days at Waterloo learning about uh, cosmology in the early years of cosmology. I remembered Milne cosmology. Now my move here to Hull five years ago coincided with uh, Arthur Milne's daughter publishing his biography. And through the help of the, the family and the, grand, um, the grandkids of Arthur Milne, we established the, the Milne Center. Um, now I mentioned uh, I'm sitting in the city of Hull, uh, the UK version of, of Hull. So just a little bit about the university itself. Um, it is surprisingly to me and probably to many people I speak to, you might not associate it with being one of the oldest universities in, in the UK. There are, I don't know, about 120, 140 universities in the UK. And it is um, 
one of the one of the oldest. It's also the place where well, the screen went by very quickly. Um, the place where the first moon rocks that were returned by Apollo 11 were analyzed uh, 50 years ago. Now we often you know think of think of those sorts of things being done elsewhere in the world, uh, but in fact those first that first dust and rocks that were brought back from Apollo 11 in July, August, uh, 1969, uh, actually made it here and were published. It only took six months to publish the first papers that went whizzing by very quickly on the screen. There are now the center, uh, it's also where if you're sitting in front of an LCD screen, uh, LCD technology was invented here by, by George Gray. The Milne Center, we established it five years ago, like I said, with the help of Milne's family. Uh, there's now 25 staff and postgraduates. It's not a large, um, research center, uh, but it is a very active one. One of the reasons I moved my group here was they provided us with uh, this very large high performance computing facility, which is largely dedicated to the work that we're doing. It's being in, in the midst of a tender process and being expanded to, to 20,000 cores. Uh, so it has been a, a very interesting, exciting time uh, over the last five years. Uh, and um, it has a bad reputation in terms of um, you know, it's one of the poorest cities in England. Uh, in fact, in terms of household income, it is the, the poorest city in, in England, the second poorest in, in the UK. Uh, but it is actually a very beautiful city sitting on the coast, lovely beaches, beautiful riverfront. So if you are ever in this neck of the woods, don't listen to the, the locals in the UK who say that Hull doesn't have much to offer. It is a really beautiful place. Um, like I say, the center, we opened it five years ago. Um, you can hopefully see uh, this woman off to the right, that is Arthur Milne's daughter, who was pivotal in establishing the center. And while it is apropos of nothing, this is my lovely wife, Kate, who teaches physics at a high school equivalent here, just around the corner. Um, what is this, you know, I, I, I tried to inject a couple of slides to link in with some of the work that's being done at the Origins Institute. Again, mo most of my own personal areas around the origin of galaxies. Uh, but we have a very active group, probably the the most active group within the center is based around the origin of the chemical elements, which is one of the fundamental pillars of the Origins Institute of Master. Uh, you know, this is a picture of a periodic table that you can see, and, and many of you will have seen in your classrooms, whether you're in high school or university. Uh, you know, what we know about the origin of all of those hundred or so elements, uh, we have a pretty good understanding of the first third or so of the periodic table, let's say, up to up to iron or so on the uh, middle of the, the fourth row there. But there's a huge uncertainty with most of the, the rest of the table. And that includes a lot of very common elements that we know and love, you know, like gold and silver and platinum and palladium, um, any number of them lead. Uh, there's a lot of mystery as to the astrophysical origin of those particular elements. And so that is a, a big part of our research uh, here based around primarily Marco Pignatari and postdocs like Richard Stancliffe and my tiny, tiny little contribution uh, supporting their, their work. The other thing which links in with what's going on at the Origins Institute, uh, is sort of a new area of research for us, astrochemistry. Uh, we brought over David Benoit from our chemistry group, who's a world leading physical chemist and have got him now working on taking that skills and moving it into the astrochemistry side of things. So he's working on a number of things which do overlap uh, more closely with the Origins Institute than my own personal research, looking at things like how various biomolecules stick to rocks versus ices in extreme environments, um, and also computing because we have access to this incredible facility, uh, more or less exclusively working on computing very advanced uh, spectral biosignatures for 14,000 odd potential biomarkers uh, that hopefully in the next generation of telescopes we may be able to probe. Uh, so these are the probably the, the two areas that most strongly overlap with some of the work that's being done within the Origins Institute. My own work in simulating galaxies does overlap with people in the Institute, including James Wosley, who I've worked with uh, for a number of years off and on, on on various projects. And I do have a simulation later on that, uh, that I've done with James. Jonathan did mention in his intro, a big part of what we do is, is outreach and engagement. Um, we have, as a center, uh, reached about 3 million people, including all of our online activities over the last four years. We do about 100 events per year. 
uh, largely with schools and colleges around the region and anywhere from small group internships, uh, work experience, through to um, both hands-on uh, experiences with students. Again, okay, this is mostly in a pre-COVID era. Uh, so we haven't been, now it's been mostly all online just as I'm delivering this online now. Um, but a, a lot of different events with sort of, like I say, about 50 or 60 colleges and schools around uh, the region from everywhere from four and five year olds at nursery through to sort of the 18 and 19 year olds who are in what we call college here, the upper years of, of high school. Um, and it's become an increasingly big part of, of what I do is the outreach and engagement. Some of it's tied to recruitment, but largely it's, I'm just doing it because I love doing that. Uh, I've been fortunate just to sort of wrap up a couple of things to work with a number of people, some of whom you may recognize if you're from the, the astrophysics or astronaut side of things. Um, these are honorary fellows of the, the center and they're, they're not just there in name only, they're part of our team. Uh, even if they are based elsewhere, but they're part of our team because they have the same ethos of trying to widen participation and diversity, particularly in this region of the country, like I said, which is one of the most socioeconomically challenged areas of, of the country. And so engagement with, with schools and colleges is critically important because we only have about one in 10 16 year olds, for example, go off to uh, higher education to university here. And so they have a, a similar ethos in terms of trying to engage uh, and widen participation. Um, we have a lot of work with Jocelyn Bell Burnell, the discoverer of, of pulsars. Um, Jocelyn again spends sort of uh, a few days per year up here. And she's with uh, four of my students, um, sort of talking through her experiences. Um, Helen Sharman is the country's first astronaut. Uh, she's born not too far from Hull. Uh, again, she was comes up again a few times a year. Comes into schools and colleges. I was here for the British Science Festival not too long ago that we hosted. And again, here with some of my uh, physics and astrophysics students. Uh, the wee one is not one of my physics and astrophysics students. That is my, my daughter, Esme, who absolutely fell in love with Helen when, on her most recent visits. Um, and I, you know, and Michael Fole, I just mentioned in passing, is also, I guess, the country's most decorated astronaut, one of the few who spent more than a year in, in space. And he's also born not too far from Hull. And again, spends, um, does a couple of trips per year to Hull and works with our students. Uh, and again, it's not about recruiting people into Hull. It's more about just engaging with a part of the country that, that is often overlooked uh, by government, if you like. And uh, a big part of what we've been doing is, again, trying to, as, as, and we're not unique in this, everyone is trying to widen participation and diversity in all of its flavors, not just in gender diversity. Our focus over the first few years I was here has been on gender diversity. Uh, we have almost tripled the number of women coming into physics by working very closely with schools and colleges around the region through various internship schemes, uh, not necessarily focusing on, the, focusing on the A students, but looking at the B and C and D students who have a passion for science, technology, engineering, and maths and providing them with intensive research opportunities, bringing them in as part of the team, co-authors on papers, and it's it has really helped us in terms of our of our recruitment and this whole program that we um, created changing face of physics is uh, was named uh, best practice in the country by the uk equality challenge unit so that was uh, probably the thing we're most proud of i guess in the the five years that i've been here so i apologize for taking 10 minutes to give you some background but i figured most of you probably wouldn't know a whole lot about the milne center or the university of hull so if you remember nothing else from this, hopefully you'll take away some of the, the history of the region and what it is that we're doing here. Back to why you're here, uh, I was gonna say tonight, because it's tonight for me, but this afternoon for you, uh, is answering this, well, I'd like to say answering this question. Uh, I'm not going to answer this question. We're gonna talk around this question uh, about are we alone? Um, and that's, you know, I, I started off by saying one of the most common questions I get is, what does the Milne Center have to do with Winnie the Pooh? The other common thing that I am faced with, with when I'm, you know, if I'm giving public talks or just chatting with people on the streets or at various events, schools, colleges, is, well, of course we're not alone because things have visited us before. And obviously I could give an entire talk on you know, UFOs and um, the, the quote unquote science around that. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, but I just want to dip in and, and look at a couple of things that are, are related to this question um, 
have we been visited before, before I get into sort of the astrophysics, which is the meat of the, the talk. So have we been visited before? Let's just look at uh, uh, just three or four things that have been put forward as potential evidence that we have been visited before. Um, this, this one is a really interesting one. This is a, a meteorite um, that was picked up uh, in the, I guess probably 1980s maybe, uh, from the Antarctic Plateau. It is a special meteorite. There's lots of meteor, meteorites around. In fact, here's one right now that I'm holding in my hands. Many of you will have seen the Chelyabinsk uh, meteor. There's just Google Chelyabinsk meteor. There's all kinds of fantastic video footage from Russia from 2013 of this um, meteor. It was probably about, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 meters or so across in size. Lots of dash cam footage of it coming down. It's really spectacular, but uh, we just purchased for a king's ransom a chunk of the Chelyabinsk uh, meteorite. So I just wanted to, uh, to show that one uh, right there. This is a special one because it's actually blasted from the surface of Mars and it was blasted. The rock itself formed at a time when there was probably liquid water on the surface so very early on in the, in the solar system. Uh, got blasted off probably, you know, you know, eons ago and wandered around the solar system and landed on Earth. Um, I can't remember what the number was, probably uh, 10, 30 million years ago, something like that. Um, and, you know, it, it got a lot of attention. You, you slice it, you dice it, you can tell that it came from the surface of Mars rather than sort of leftover material from the formation of the solar system. And when you zoom in uh, with a microscope, you saw these interesting features that look like, you know, little worms, you know, sort of, they kind of look like, um, you know, there are things on Earth, microbacterial things that look kind of like this. And it looks like the fossilized remain of some sort of, maybe not microbacteria, but sort of nanobacteria, tiny, tiny little, Thing. So it did get a lot of attention. It was a headline news story on lots of newspapers um, in, I guess it's what, around 96 or so. So you know, we're only talking 25 years ago or so. Um, and e even President Bill Clinton at the time had a you know, press release, a uh, press conference standing on the lawn in front of the White House, you know, basically announcing to the world that you know, our, you know, our, our place has changed. We're no longer alone. There is evidence now that there was life on Mars sometime in the past. You know, it's not life like you and I, but, but still life. Uh, there were a handful of hardy geologists who were sort of jumping up and down saying, you know, you know pump the brakes on this. There are things here on Earth, abiotic, non-biological things that could lead to the, these sorts of things that have the shape or what we call the morphology of things that look like fossils. And you know, you don't you have to go too far. You can pick up this crystalline structure called vermicular, the sodium calcium um, silica crystal. And again, if you zoom in, um, you know, what looks to be like a chunk of quartz in your hand actually starts to look more and more like a writhing pile of worms. Um, it has nothing to do with worms. It has nothing to do with life. It's just a cautionary tale that just because something looks like it might be life doesn't necessarily mean it is life without getting into the, the definition of, of life just yet. Um, and it's taken sort of 20 odd years, but consensus has now come around across the scientific community that this had nothing to do with life on Mars back when there was water. It is a non-biological, a biological one, but it did get a lot of attention and it's still a, you know, a fascinating story that links astrophysics and, and geology and biology together. Now there's other ones which are, do also get a lot of attention, which are probably a little less scientific. Um, we've got these rovers that wander the surface of Mars taking gazillions of pictures and just like if you take gazillions of pictures of clouds eventually you're going to find some clouds that look like planes or trains or automobiles or bunnies or cats or whatever the case may be. You take enough pictures of rocks you're eventually going to find things that look interesting and so every once in a while you know people go trawling through the the NASA databases and they find things that look like evidence of life on the surface of Mars. You've got the example here of a, what looks to be a, a woman sitting on the, on the edge of a ravine, resting her arm on her, uh, on her knees, if you like. Uh, you've got what looks to be a frog. You've got a floating spoon. Uh, I've got an iguana. Somebody left a bowler hat sitting on the surface. There's a, a rat as well. Uh, they're all interesting things. And here in the UK, we've got the Daily Mail that likes to put out, um, you know, clickbait stories every once in a while. And whenever a nifty picture like this comes out, 
um, they do um, pick that up and, and put that out there. But again, you know, these are just, there's no scale on these. Most of these are just tiny little rocks that when you catch them in the right light happen to look like uh, something to do with life on Mars, but really don't have anything to do with life on Mars. You don't have to go to Mars to find these fascinating things. This is a psychological effect called pareidolia. Um, you can just go wandering through the Sahara, taking pictures of rocks. And if you do so, you will find that there are some weird looking rocks here on Earth that you know look like, for example, this gigantic hedgehog, which I can assure you is not a gigantic hedgehog. But again, it's that same sort of effect, pareidolia, something that when you look at it from a particular angle, looks like life, but it's not. More serious ones, um, there's this thing called the wow signal from this is 1977, I think. Um, this is a radio telescope in Ohio, and it was scanning the sky, so the, the early search for extraterrestrial intelligence, if you like, SETI experiments using a, a radio telescope. Um, the astronomer who was working you know, that night, this was at a, at a time when you weren't collecting data on, you know, uh, digital devices. You were still collecting it on reams and reams of, of data. So they came in the next day, they looked at the scrolls of, of paper with lots of lots of numbers and letters and circled this thing and um, in red there, the numbers and letters don't really matter all that much and, and just wrote wow beside it. Um, it got a lot of attention because it was a very intense, incredibly intense burst when the telescope was looking towards um, towards a, a globular, cluster, globular cluster near the galactic center. Uh, very short, sharp, intense burst, lasted a couple of minutes in a very neat, narrow frequency range. And again, an enormous amount of care and attention went into trying to, trying to figure out what the source of this was, trying to eliminate all potential internal sources of electronic noise, uh, anything external that might be going on with any sort of knowledge of whatever satellites were around at the time. Um, look, this has got a, an enormous Wikipedia page. There's been lots of books written about it. Uh, it's still hotly debated. Um, probably it was some sort of electronic noise that they've not been able to pin down. It's never been seen again. This part of the sky has been scanned, you know, again, millions of times over and over and over again, much deeper levels, nothing's ever been seen. Um, it could be, you know, radar signals bouncing off some satellite and coming back down into the, the feed horn of the telescope. But if you want to hang your hat on something as a potential alien thing that we've not been able to explain away, uh, there are still those who believe this may be evidence of some, some signal, probably not, probably electronic noise of some sort, but you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, one of the questions I do get asked though is, um, uh, and it does maybe foreshadow some questions you might have is how far away could we pick up a radio signal from, from an alien civilization? And well, you know, we've been leaking, you know, TV signals, radio signals, you know, for the last, what, hundred, hundred years, let's say. So, um, you know, those, those signals, radio signals from a hundred years ago, are still moving their way across the cosmos. Now they get weaker and weaker and weaker as they, go further and further away, but those, those signals are propagating their way outwards. And so you could ask, well, if you took a large radio telescope here on Earth, say Arecibo, if it was working in the Northern Hemisphere, how far away could you pick up the equivalent of leaked radio noise that's, um, you know, whether you're trying to communicate or not is irrelevant. If you have any sort of radio technology, it, it is leaking its way across the cosmos. Um, and the best guess is, with a telescope, you know, a large telescope like Arecibo, you could probably get about at about ten light years or so away from us. So it's not really far, but there's a, you know, you're you're getting out past a few stars at least. In the southern hemisphere, you've got Parkes Radio Telescope, which is a lot smaller. You can probably only go out maybe three light years or so and be able to pick up this sort of leaked radio signal. Um, next generation square kilometer array radio facility will probably be able to go out as far as. 50 light years or so and would be able to pick up the signal um, whether you're trying to communicate or not of leaked radio emission that's coming from any advanced civilization that might be out there. Uh, and, you know, again, you could spend an enormous amount of time talking about all these things. Uh, you know, this is one of the stars that looks like any other star in the sky that was studied by, by Kepler looking for transiting uh, planets going in front, casting a shadow and then looking at the light curve to look for the evidence and characterizing the planets. 
Now, this particular star, its light curve behaved a lot differently. It wasn't, you know, this nice little regular dip as a planet went in front of it. The light curve was sort of going all over the place, disappearing completely, then coming back up, and then the next day dropping down 50%. So it was up and down and up and down. It was behaving differently than any star that was known. Uh, again, got a lot of attention in some of the tabloid media, people suggesting maybe you were seeing a partially completed Dyson sphere. And basically, you could just think of it as solar cells, um, you know, all pointing at the star and you sort of wrap the star around with these uh, solar batteries. And what you were seeing was this rotating, partially constructed um, Dyson sphere that was blocking large chunks of the light as it went around. Um, that's been dismissed now. You're looking at something uh, probably like a big dust cloud that's moving uh, across, blocking large chunks of the light, because you can look at how it blocks the light in different colors, in the blue and in the red and in the infrared. It's not some solid structure that's blocking the light. It is something that is dusty and it is very likely. Some people thought it might be comets raining down, which is what this cartoon drawing is showing. Uh, probably some sort of big dust cloud that's uh, passing in front. And the last one on this is, again, like I said, you could cover all kinds of things from you know, UFOs up in the top right. It's a very clever one. If you look very carefully, all of the trees are exactly the same. That tree is the same as that tree. It's the same as that tree. It's the same as that tree. Somebody knocked this off in their Mac using some Blender software up in their attic, and just composited multiple trees into the image. That was very, very clever of them. But again, you've got crop circles and pyramids, the iron pillar of Delhi that supposedly doesn't rest and so that or doesn't rust. So claims have been made by people like Eric Van Dyneken back in the Chariots of the Gods days that this was clearly evidence of aliens, because how could the Indian ironsmiths of you know, a couple thousand years ago be able to do this? Well, it was just insulting because they were way more advanced than the rest of the world and understood that if you took iron and infused it with a bit of um, with the layer of, of phosphorus, and basically stop the thing from, from rusting. So again, there's lots of these things that have been put forth as evidence that we've been visited before. I think we can probably dismiss most of them as being evidence of complex advanced life being out there. So let's come back to the astrophysics of what we're here for and, and answer, looking at this question, are we alone? So first thing I'm gonna do is, is just step outside of the Milky Way galaxy in which we live and look down on it from above. It's what we call a grand design spiral galaxy. You can see the beautiful spiral arms, um, a bar cutting across the center. There's a supermassive black hole in the, right in the center. Uh, the sun sits about halfway out, sort of in the suburbs, um, sitting between two spiral arms. There's not much around us, which is probably a good thing. Uh, it's a pretty quiet, pretty sedate area. Most of the action is in the spiral arms, which may be 10 times denser, if you like, with gas and dust and stuff. And all there's about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. Almost all of them are moving around in a clockwise direction on this cartoon that you see there. And they're all moving at roughly the same speed, half a million miles per hour. Sorry, I've lived in the UK too long. I've now switched uh, away from the metric system. So they're all moving at about half a million miles per hour in nice, more or less circular orbits, whether you're in the inner part of the disk, the outer part of the disk, they're all moving at roughly half a million miles per hour. Where we sit, we're moving at almost the same speed as the spiral arms. It's called co-rotation. I'll come back to that in, in just a second. So you've got 100 billion stars. So you've got probably hundreds of billions of planets out there. So it's very easy. The numbers get so overwhelmingly big. It's very easy to think there's got to be something out there, right? I mean, there's just so many stars. There must be something out there. Um, so let's just look at this question of, of life. And this is the only equation in the talk, a very simple equation, is sort of a cooking analogy as to what life might be. So I'm going to define it as, again, cooking analogy. I need ingredients, the basic building blocks of life. I need an oven to cook those ingredients. And I need an appropriate amount of cooking time. I'm not going to spend any time on the cooking time. We know of one biosphere, and that's ours. Um, life did not spontaneously appear. It took some period of time. There's much debate whether it was hundreds of millions of years, a billion years. Um, but it does take some time for life to appear based on a sample of one, of course. It's... Um, uh, you know, the, the first billion years, even more of the Earth is not a particularly um, wonderful place for life to develop. It's still forming, you're still getting pummeled, you haven't developed an atmosphere properly yet. Uh, so it's not a fantastic place for those, those nascent very beginnings of life to, to, take, to take hold. So 
But that aside, we'll take the cooking time out of it. Just look at the ingredients in the oven just very quickly. So what are the right sort of ingredients for life? Um, again, there's, there's people here at the Origins Institute who know a lot more about this. So I'm going to boil it down to something really simple. And uh, what do we think of one of the important ingredients is probably carbon. Why? Now there's, there's lots of other postulates out there. There's other forms of life. I mean, me growing up was, you know, the original series Star Trek. You know, silicon-based life was the big thing that I grew up with, the Horta here in the episode Devil in the Dark. But, you know, carbon is thought to be important largely because it's this amazing, fantastic element. It, it's the most friendly element. Everything likes to stick to carbon. It's great. Uh, so if you want to build complex life, you probably need complex molecules. And complex organic molecules are, are all built around carbon. You, know, you, can, you can stick hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur, and you make elegant, beautiful, complex molecules. When you try doing that with silicon, it just doesn't work as well. It's just not as friendly a, an element. It likes to form rocks and crystalline structures. Um, so again, it could be carbon bias and can't argue with that, but that's what I'm gonna start with right now is being probably, there are some reasonable uh, chemical arguments as to why carbon is fundamentally important. And probably, you know, the other one that is often put forward as the right sort of ingredient is liquid water. Um, it's this magical liquid relative to almost all the other liquids in the sense that um, it is liquid over a, a reasonable range in temperature, but more importantly, um, it's, it's this fantastic solvent. So if you are that, again, the beginnings of life trying to feed, you know, those beginnings of life are just like me and you, you know, they need to eat, they need to go to the toilet. And so water is a great solvent for extracting energy from your environment. It's also, um, it's also a great medium for carrying waste material away from you. Uh, it's also great when it freezes, it freezes from the top. So ice is less dense than water. You drop an ice cube in water, it floats, it doesn't sort of sink down. So again, if you're life that's trying to get a foothold in a hostile environment where you're going through wild climactic changes, um, you know, if you're, you know, waterborne life that's, again, trying to, trying to get that foothold, if you do spend, you know, however long in a phase where you're in a deep freeze, freezes from the top, you still have the liquid water underneath. And again, that means that you can extract energy from your environment. It means you can carry out waste material. So you may be able to do this with other liquids. There's, a, I'm sure people in the Origins Institute will be able to answer lots of questions about other liquids that might play a similar role. Uh, liquid methane, only liquid at extremely low temperatures. So maybe your energy extraction is a little bit different. Um, but you know, this is often put forward as two of the fundamental ingredients. So if you sort of buy that premise that you need uh, or liquid water is probably important at some level. Um, you need a place where liquid water can exist. And so you need to have the right sort of temperature. And what that means is you don't want to be too close to a star because it'd be too hot. Uh, and you don't want to be too far away, be too cold, and free solid. So there's that habitable zone, that uh, Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot, not too cold, temperature is just right. So in a, for a planet like uh, Earth, it sits right in the middle of the habitable zone currently. Uh, relative to a star, uh, this yellow star in the middle, which has got the number one beside it because it's one solar mass. Stars that are bigger are hotter, which means you got to go further away. So the habitable zone is further away. And when it's smaller or cooler, then you need to get closer for the, that, to be in the sweet spot for the liquid water to exist. Um, problem with the, the big stars, and once you get up to sort of two solar mass, twice the mass of the sun, uh, they, the stars don't live very long. And the heavier they are, the quicker they die. They live fast, they die young. And so once you get up to two solar masses, three solar masses, they, don't just, they just don't stick around probably long enough for much in the way of complex life to develop. They quickly burn out their fuel and they're gone. Stars that are lower mass, half the mass of the sun, they're more common, uh, but you have to get butted up right against them, pretty close to them. And so there's some thought, and again, it's hotly debated, and I'm sure there's people there who'll be able to talk about it, but you have to get quite close to the star when it's a low mass star to be in that sweet spot for the liquid water to exist. Problem is when you get butted up against them, you start getting um, pummeled with intense radiation and uh, the chromospheres, the, the atmospheres of the stars are very, very active. So you, even though you're in the sweet spot for temperature, they're pretty nasty, hostile environments. And so again, there's much debate in the literature as to whether these low mass stars are the right place for, for life to develop. The good thing is they last a long time. 
the bad thing is, like I said, you got to be butted up right against them. So you do have to start worrying about radiation effects. And, you know, you can think about, you know, get a lot more complex with the development of life here on earth. You know, there are, you know, life is pretty robust. It, you know, it, it doesn't form absolutely everywhere, but, you know, between temperatures, between, you know, zero and a hundred degrees centigrade over a certain, you know, pretty wide range of acidity, a wide range of salinity, saltiness. Um, you know, life, there is this sort of three-dimensional volume that you can see here, which is sort of the region where life can develop here on earth. It's not infinite. It doesn't form absolutely everywhere. And this could become an issue when you start thinking about, and I'll end on that shortly, the, you know, looking for life on say subsurface of Mars with any liquid water that is there beneath the South Pole, for example, is probably really, really salty, like way beyond the salinity level of, of anything that you encounter here on Earth and where anything could probably, at least life as we know it, uh, would be able to survive in. Um, uh, if you looked at the acidity in the upper atmosphere of Venus, which we'll end on towards the end, you know, the, it, its pH level is way off the scale of anything where life as we know it could ever form. So, you know, these, again, it's a large volume, so life is fairly robust but it's not infinite um, using our, again, our biosphere of one. What other things about the oven might be important? We talked about temperature. Um, magnetic field probably is important. Um, uh, you know, our Earth is a giant bar magnet with a north and south magnetic pole, it causes, you know, aurora borealis and astralis, which is great, but more importantly, it sort of perform, it, it serves as a protective sheath for again, damaging to cosmic rays that come from the sun that would otherwise slowly evaporate our atmosphere. It's thought to be one of the primary reasons, not the only reason, but the primary reason why, for example, Mars doesn't have an atmosphere is because it doesn't have a magnetic field to protect it. Um, Venus also doesn't have a magnetic field. Now it's able to hold onto its atmosphere largely because of where it sits relative to the sun and a magnetic field gets induced. So the way this the sun interacts with the, atmosphere, the upper atmosphere, the thick clouds, it does induce a magnetic field, which allows it to hold onto its magnetic field. But in, inherently, Venus and Mars do not have magnetic fields. Now, what is the statistics of magnetic fields in, in terrestrial planets that are maybe out there, hundreds of billions of planets that may be out there? You know, who knows? We've got a sample of a handful here, and you've, you've basically got one with Earth and probably, probably Mercury as well, which is an interesting one as well. Um, we also have, what, what else is interesting about our in local environment where life is developed. We've got this really gigantic moon. It's crazy big. Um, it's not the biggest moon in the solar system, but relative to the size of the earth, it's really big. So again, there's a lot of debate in the literature as to how important a big moon might be. You know, it's, it's roughly about 1%, so about 100 moons would weigh the same as the earth. And, but it plays a fundamental role in keeping our orbit really stable. As we go around the, the sun, we're tilted over by 20 odd degrees or so, it's called the obliquity, but it's really stable as it goes around the sun. It's always tilted at exactly the same angle. And that's because we've got this big heavy anchor that keeps us stable. All the other moons, the other 200 or so in the solar system are utterly inconsequential. They're you know, a factor of you know, a thousand below in, in terms of the relative mass of the moon. So there is, again, some debate, you know, the big moon helps with long-term stability, which means you get relatively long-term climate stability. If you take away that big moon and give it one of the, a tiny one like the other planets have, the planet, um, it's probably an exaggeration, but it, it starts to behave more like a bowling ball as it goes around, not on time scales that you, you would picture a bowling ball spinning around, but losing that stability does mean you, you lose long-term climate stability. Again, we don't know a lot about exomoons around exoplanets, and we don't really know a whole lot about exactly how important this might be, but it might play an important part in the development of life. Other weird things, so where am I going with all this? Um, so far, everything I've talked about um, you know, makes the Earth look special. Now, if you think that life is very common out there, probably the thing you don't want is stringing together a whole bunch of things that make us unique. Uh, you know, just the right sort of star in just the right sort of place in the galaxy with a planet that just sits in the right place for, habitable, uh, for liquid water uh, that has a magnetic field. Now, you know, we started off with hundreds of billions of potential planets out there, but if, and each one of these things maybe 
reduces by a factor of 10 the number of potential planets. But what you don't want to have is a whole bunch of things that one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, reduce you by a factor of 10. Because it takes you from a really big number to a much smaller number. Um, other things about our solar system, it looks weird. Um, you know, the masses of our planets don't look like the masses of planets around other um, in extrasolar planetary systems, the thousands of them that we know about now. Um, we have, our planets don't have, we don't have super Earth, which are two to three times heavier than the Earth. Um, the most of the planetary systems we know about are, you know, butted up much more closely to their host star than ours. So again, it's probably largely driven by the, what we call the selection function, the way that Kepler has, is much more sensitive to big heavy things that are close in um, rather than very extended planetary systems with little planets out there. This will become clearer and clearer over the next 10, 20 years as the next generation of satellites come out. But if you took what is there right now, uh, what we know about the X thousand planets, uh, the extrasolar planetary systems that are out there, about a thousand of them, don't look anything like our solar system. Um, okay, so let me just say something about, um, come back to uh, wrap up in the next 10 minutes and step out and look at our galaxy again, looking down on it. I mentioned we're all moving at all these 100 billion stars, half, half a million miles per hour. We're sitting about halfway out. We are, where we move, where we're sitting, there's not much around us between the spiral arms and we're moving at almost the same speed as the spiral arms, but half a million miles per hour. If we were a little bit closer, a little bit further away, we would get run over by the spiral arms or catch up to the spiral arms much more regularly. This is called co-rotation and we are, we are near co-rotation as we go around, which means we spend a lot of time without a whole lot around us. Uh, and, but, you know, we do every once in a while, um, every hundred million years or so, we do catch up to the spiral arm and pass through it. And so it's a, probably a poor analogy, but you could think of a, an aerial swing in nice calm conditions. Everything goes around nice and symmetrically. If you do get a gust of wind, that symmetry can get broken. If you get a really strong gust of wind, these things can run into each other. Now, when we pass through a spiral arm or a spiral arm passes over us, it's 10 times denser. Now, it doesn't bother our planets where we sit down close to the sun which is what you can see up here in the top left, the solar system with the little circles being the planets that we know and love. When we get run over by a spiral arm, okay, it, you know, our planets keep going around the sun, there's no issue. More of an issue is the cloud of comets that surround our solar system, the Oort cloud, where there's billions, possibly trillions of, of comets out there. They're loosely held on by gravity. And when they feel a shock of a spiral arm sort of passing over it, it has the, potential to shake loose comets, many of which, because they're so loosely held on, many of which will fly away from us, but some of them will come raining down to the inner part of the solar system. And every once in a while, you know, one of these big things can, can run into us. Uh, it probably happened, last time this happened was 65 million years ago, the Cretaceous tertiary ex mass extinction, again, some debate over exactly what role the comet or large asteroid played, but uh, it took a, you know, between 70 and 90% of the species that existed at the time. Now, we're still here, so obviously it wasn't a complete biosphere, biosphere killer. Um, was probably a, you know, this was probably a, something that had a size of maybe 10 to 50 miles or so across, but it was enough to wipe out a large fraction of the species that existed on the earth. Uh, again, we're still here, so it obviously doesn't wipe you out every time. But obviously, if you, you know, interviewed the dinosaurs, they would say that this was a bad thing. And it's not just us that, that experiences this. You know, you can just look at Jupiter. This was, again, about 25 years ago in Comet shoebaker levy uh, just when I was finishing up my PhD in Vancouver, uh, plowed into the surface of, into the atmosphere of Jupiter. Having Jupiter out there is good. Jupiter is like a, a big vacuum. It's a gravitational vacuum. So this might be a part of the, you know, part of the puzzle of, of life developing is we've got this protective shield out there that does hoover up some of these comets that do come in that otherwise might make it to the inner part of the solar system. Fortunately, you know, the solar system is mostly empty space and most of these comets do miss us, of course. But again, it only takes that one to do it. And if you were to ask me hand on heart, what's gonna wipe us out um, in, a, in the foreseeable future, you know, taking us ourselves out of the mix, 
It's going to be this star that you see in the bottom right there. It just looks like any other star. Unlike most of the stars that are going around half a million miles an hour around the galaxy in nice circular orbits, this one is like the barrel of a gun pointed straight at us. It is racing towards us about 30,000 miles per hour. Fortunately, it's 60 light years away. But in a million years time, which is what this green circle uh, on this figure is, it shows how close any of the stars around us have either gotten to us in the past or will in the near future. It's actually going to pass right through our solar system. But other than the sun, it'll be the, the next brightest thing in the sky. Um, it'll pass through the Oort cloud of comets very slowly, enough that it's going to shake up an enormous number of comets. It's a very difficult simulation to do inside of a computer, but the best guess is that it will shake loose about 1 million comets, uh, 10 million comets over a million year period. So what that means is that roughly every month, a naked eye comet will appear in the sky. And so, I mean, the sky, if you're an astronomer who loves looking up at the sky, it's going to be great if you love comets. If you like looking at stars and galaxies, it's going to be terrible because the sky is going to be covered in comets. Again, space is mostly empty, so most of them will miss us. And, you know, hopefully, it, you know, we'll have Bruce Willis's disembodied head, like in Armageddon, going up there to deflect these things. Or Elon Musk will have some shield that's up in place to block these things coming in. But if you're looking at something astrophysical to take us out uh, in the near future, that's probably what's going to be. Um, and what else do you have to, to worry about as we pass through spiral arms? It's not just sort of gravitational shocks and comets coming in. Uh, you have to worry about exploding stars because that's where most of the heavy stars are being born and where they die is inside the spiral arms. Now, when they explode, big shock wave comes out. Um, all the beautiful colors there you see are the different chemical elements that we're all made of. This is where they, you know, everything you can see with your eyes more or less came from one of these objects that exploded billions of years ago. There's a lot of debate as to what the, the, you know, the death radius or the lethal radius is of a supernova, just like any sort of bomb that goes off. If you're far away from it, it doesn't hurt you. If you're too close, it does. Uh, same thing with a supernova. Best guess is the number is around 30 light years or so. If you're closer than 30 light years, the energetics is probably sufficient to evaporate your biosphere. Uh, this happened about 10 million years ago, which is you know, not long ago. By our standards. We were up where we are in the top right corner where planet Earth is about 100 light years away. We were far enough away that it didn't wipe us out, but we were close enough that the shock wave did go over us, left a nice thin layer of radioactive iron, what's called iron 60, it's an isotope of iron, only comes from exploding stars. So we know that the shock wave passed over us because we know the half-life of, of iron 60. So these sorts of things do happen. We're still here, maybe it's just lucky. Uh, but these are the sorts of astrophysical things you have to navigate if you do want life to, to develop. And on top of all of this, you know, thinking about, you know, is life ubiquitous? You know, stars do evolve with time. Even a star like the sun, it doesn't change a whole lot from day to day to year to year, but it is getting brighter and more luminous. And okay, and it's, I'm not talking a million years here. I'm moving ahead 500 million years, which is pretty long. And that's, uh, you know, it's only been, what, 200 million years since uh, we've had mammals here on Earth. So we're looking, you know, another few hundred million years in the future. Um, the sun will be 5% brighter, 5% more luminous than it is right now. But that's enough to start boiling off the oceans. Average temperature will move from sort of 20 degrees to uh, Celsius to something like, you know, 50 uh, maybe eight, yeah, somewhere between, yeah, be up around 50 degrees centigrade will be the average temperature. In a billion years, you're up around 80 degrees. Uh, so we're not going to be able to, you know, we won't be inhabiting Earth at that point in time, other than, you know, going deep underwater, deep underground, or again, Elon Musk pushes planet Earth out a bit further. Um, so just to finish up, what am I doing right now? This galactic habitable zone that Jonathan alluded to at the very beginning. Uh, we thought a, a little bit about where the conditions are necessary, um, you know, where would the best conditions be for life to develop? We, and I, I've talked about these things, the, the metals, the building blocks for terrestrial planets. You know, where do you have the right mix of chemical elements to form the right sort of terrestrial planets? Uh, where do you have you know, stability, where you're not getting pummeled by spiral arms? Where, um, where are you, you know, in a statistical sense, away from exploding stars, from supernova? You know, the inner part of the galaxy where most of the stars are being born now is not a great place for life to develop because the stellar density is much higher. You do have exploding stars around you all the time in some sense. So, you know, that's, again, in a statistical sense, probably not the best place. 
So we used, um, you know, we've got uh, James Wadsley there at the Origin Institute, his code uh, gasoline, which is a hydrodynamics code for modeling how galaxies form and evolve. Um, we link in the origin of the chemical elements and put in, uh, feed that into James's code. And we look at how the chemical elements get distributed around the galaxy. And we can walk our way through and determine where are the best places statistically to avoid supernova, to avoid spiral arms, to move in co-rotation, uh, where you've got sufficient building blocks for terrestrial planets. And this was the, um, the early work uh, that uh, Jonathan mentioned in his, in his introduction that National Geographic uh, highlighted. The tools that we're using there, that smooth, this hydrodynamics code that um, uh, James is, uh, is the same sort of fundamental code that uh, was invented uh, in, I guess that was in the mid 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 seventies. Smooth particle hydrodynamics. It was used to look primarily for fundamental basic science. How does energy move from the center of a star to the outskirts? Much like our namesake here, Arthur Milne was working on uh, back in the pre-war days. Um, it's the same technique that is now used in many different areas of engineering and science. So when I'm talking about careers for, to to scientists, to people who are really interested in astronomy and astrophysics. And yeah, if you're in too close, then you have to worry about supernova exploding around you all the time. Uh, best guess right now, probably 50% of the stars have planets. Um, yeah, that's a big number, that's good. Um, best guess right now, maybe 10% have rocky planets in the habitable zone. All of these numbers are very uncertain. They are consistent with press release that came out from NASA just a couple of weeks ago though as well. Uh, Again, best guess, you're getting even more speculative. Let's just say that one in 10 have a magnetic field to allow you to retain an atmosphere for life to develop, at least surface life to develop. Um, if you think moons, stabilizing moons are important, let's just say maybe one in 10 have a heavy, sufficiently heavy stabilizing moon. Maybe that's generous, but those are at least numbers to play with. So you start off with 100 billion stars. That takes you down. You know, each one of them by themselves, again, is not a big deal, but you start stringing them together takes you down to about a half a million potential advanced civilizations, if you like, uh, if you take the sort of the optimistic numbers. I don't know if you're a little bit more pessimistic on some of the numbers, it doesn't take much to take you down to 500 potential civilizations. And I know everyone complains about the use of the Drake equation to determine how many advanced civilizations are out there, but it, you know, it's a useful talking point, a useful tool to play with. And, you know, the thing that comes into all of this is, that just because those are potential civilizations doesn't mean they're there. And so you have to ask the question, how long does a civilization last for? And, you know, we've been in our advanced phase where we couldn't communicate through, you know, radio wave leakage, you know, in the last hundred years, that's how long we've been communicable, um, communicative. Um, but, you know, in that hundred years, we've almost wiped ourselves out on more than one occasion. And whether we'll last the next hundred or the next hundred, who knows? But let's be optimistic and say, if you just play the game and say, well, look, an advanced civilization can live 20,000 years. And so if each advanced civilization does survive for 20,000 years, how many advanced civilizations are out there right now? It would be one. So I guess that's sort of the, the pessimistic end of that is that despite going through all the astrophysics and we will fine tune a lot of these numbers over the next 10, 20 years or so, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you are playing with the Drake equation, uh, it really does come down to the biggest uncertainty, which is that socio-political one, if you like, how long do you actually live for? Um, despite all that, it may sound a bit pessimistic. You know, I do want to believe. Um, hopefully there is something there is something out there. And just to end, where do, you, where do I look for extrasolar life? In my lifetime, where am I going to find it? It's probably going to be here in the solar system if it's anywhere. Um, it may be in underneath the surface, like I said, of Mars and the the sludgy, swampy water that exists beneath the South Pole. Maybe it'll be the plumes or the geysers of water shooting up from Enceladus and Europa. You know, we've got the debate over the last month or so about the detection of phosphine in the upper atmosphere of, of Venus. Not a very nice environment. Um, they, I guess the jury's still out on, on, on that one. Um, but last but not least, if we can't actually find it, well, we can seed it ourselves. Sitting on the surface of the moon right now, 
is a crashed um, lander, the bear sheet from the Israeli Space Agency went up last year, crashed on the surface. Aboard that was um, you know, our host, Jonathan, works on these uh, water bears, tardigrades. These are the most amazing things to me. Um, the hardiest life forms, stick them outside the space station and dehydrate them and then bring them back in after a couple of weeks and rehydrate some fraction of them. Well, on top of that, in that space lander, there were a bunch of tardigrades um, sort of stuck between some layers of a DVD in dehydrated mode. So right now there is, uh, whether they're you know revivable or not after that amount of time, who could say, but there are some dehydrated, possibly hibernating tardigrades sitting on the surface of the moon, even as you and I are speaking. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brad. That was uh, fantastic. And thanks for the little plug about tardigrades at the end. Uh, <laughs> um, we we uh, do have some questions that arrived before you gave your talk. And I pose uh, two of them now. Sure. And, and, uh, maybe one or two that arrived during your talk. And then we'll have to cut it short because Brad has to meet with our graduate. Oh, Brad has the pleasure of meeting with our graduates. <laughs> and <immediately. It's> safe. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me get to the questions. Um, Oh, and thank you also, by the way, for mentioning Sir Martin Rees. Uh, he was the very first Origins Institute speaker of all time. So uh, I, I was just speaking with him last week as I was checking up on all of our honorary fellows to make sure they're all happy and healthy during the various lockdown or second second lockdown that we're going through right now. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. So uh, among the many questions that were posed even before the talk, several involved the likelihood for detecting other life forms. And given the technologies available and distances possible, uh, other variables like that. And you touched on distances in your talk. Thank you for that. Um, but given that some known unknowns about some of the ingredients you described recently have become observational fact, and you touched on these with the Drake equation toward the end, but perhaps you could just comment more generally on the likelihood for detecting signs of life. Is there, um, it, like in the near future with increases in technology and, and so on? Yeah, I think that that's a really good a really good question. Um, okay, I okay. I'm going to take out um, you know communication with advanced civilizations through you know, the SETI things. I'm I guess I'm you know, I'm skeptical of that. Where I do think we do have the the potential is is the finding the appropriate biosignatures. Now whether it's you know the, maybe this phosphine detection will disappear and and you know to and to and, you know in some sense finding life in the solar system. I mean, if you are, if you're a cynic, um, I mean, to me, it'd be the most exciting thing probably in my lifetime, but I can understand why there are skeptics who say, look, our solar system all formed from the same material. You know, I am sitting here holding in my hand right now, there is two pieces of the moon. I bought these lunar meteorites. Um, and so, you know, things blast into the moon and they land here on Earth. I showed you the chunk of Mars landed here on Earth. You know, it's the same way. We've shared material with other planets during the early nascent phases of the solar system. So I know that there are those who are, you know, way more knowledgeable than I that say it'd be super exciting, but it is sort of the, you know, there has been some crosstalk of material, let's say, in the, throughout the, the time of uh, the solar system. So, um, but I think where we are, where to me the most exciting thing, and, and maybe it'll happen. It, we'll have, uh, we will detect it with, you know, you know, people have talked about JWST and using it to detect, you know, James Webb Space Telescope for detecting, not maybe not necessarily the same biosignatures that, you know, necessarily that we know and love, but it's it's you know JWST might be able to detect um, some, you know, we talk about anoxic life forms, you know, things that form in an environment where there isn't oxygen, let's say. And so people have talked about using CO2, CO, CH4 as biosignatures and JWS. Again, there's some debate as to how well JWSC will be for, for detecting these sort of things, but there is there is a literature out there. And it may be that, you know, may, you know, the next generation where we can image to some extent planets in habitable zones and, and maybe not life per se, depending on your definition of life, but, you know, looking at uh, you know flora being able to to detect if you monitor a habitable zone planet and you see its 
color changing with time, you know, with seasons, if you like, maybe what you are seeing is, you know, the appearance of, of plant life coming and going depending on, on seasons. I think that that's a real possibility. And I think a real possibility might, again, with the next generation, big telescopes, again, when, a, when, a, when a planet passes in front of a star and you take a spectrum of the star, even now we can detect the atmosphere of the intervening planet sometimes, if it, depending on what the atmosphere is, you know, really sodium rich, crazy atmospheres that have nothing to do with life, but we can actually detect the presence of different compounds in the atmospheres of certain planets. You know, the next generation, you know, if I was, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sort of optimistic that, you know, if we're going to detect it, that's how we're going to do it. It'll be through absorption, absorption lines of planetary atmospheres passing in front of stars, possibly with direct imaging of, of the equivalent of, you know, plant life coming and going depending on season. So I'm, I'm, Cautiously optimistic. Uh, I, I may not be around, you know, but 20, 30 years from now, I'll be getting towards the end. I'm, I'm going to guess, maybe let's say 30 years. Um, I, I, I think we'll know in the first 10 years of the operation of these next telescopes. I mean, this is what the, that's what's funding these next telescopes. It's answering fundamental questions like that: Are we alone searching for life? If we don't detect it in 10 years of intensive studies of, of atmospheres of planets and direct imaging of planets. Um, then I guess I start to get a little bit more mm, skeptical, but depressed probably. <laughs> okay, and so related to that, there's another question. Um, it's kind of the, I guess it's somewhat pessimistic. Uh, how would we know if we were the only life forms? In other words, when we're looking for life, it's kind of the classic question. How do we? Yeah, I know. And I look, I, I get asked this question. I really don't have a good answer to it. I mean, I we all have our biases as to what. And you know, what what life should look like, <laughs> um, and I don't know what you know complex intelligent life will look like. I part of me likes to think that and it, again, it's probably you know maybe it's a complete bias is that you know plant life is plant life. The plants may be different, but um, you know it, part of me just thinks if if we can discover plant life, whatever that might be. Um, I like to think that we can recognize, we'll rec we may not recognize what sort of plants it is and it may be completely different. Um, and, but I think if I can, if I can see something changing on a rapid time scale enough that I, and, and peer in a sort of periodic sense in the way of seasons, then I, I could be convinced that you're seeing plant life. Um, and then I would be I would be a lot more optimistic uh, about things. Now, whether we're going to recognize, you know, Neumann machines and intelligent, I, I look, I have no, I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, we have time for just one more. And I, uh, in, before we close, I just want to thank you again and on behalf of the audience. And as well, let the audience know that we will respond to your questions uh, electronically if we don't get to them today. So, but uh, Brad will meet with the graduate students and we're already impinging on some of that time. So it was just one last question. And this bears on some of the research perhaps you've done with uh, James, I'm not sure, but um, do solid, solid planets, rocky planets, always develop closer to the sun than gas planets? That, you know, I, it's, I'm sure someone sitting in the audience probably knows the, the answer quicker than me. The, no, that's not the case, because I, I actually did look up, uh, I should have, I, I need to pull out a picture of this for my next talk. Um, you know, the, the answer is no. I have seen examples now because I, you know, it's true we've got lots of, we don't have a lot of um, information on really well populated extrasolar. So, you know, we've got, this star has got one and this star has got two and this one's got three. There are, there are some, you know, like Trappist and other ones where we do have large numbers. And, um, and I, yeah, I can't, I'm not going to be able to Google it right now, but um, I did, did see an example of one where they had big ones in, in the inner part and some smaller ones a, a little bit further out. So I'm gonna guess that there's someone sitting there who knows a whole lot more about planet formation who can probably talk through the statistics of, of that. I think the observational statistics are not well known, even though we have 5,000 extrasolar planets, they're probably around 2,000 stars. So we don't have the great statistics of solar systems per se, um, but you could probably you learn from people who work on planetary formation simulations, how often big ones form here or in the middle or further out. Um, it's a really good question. Okay, great. Uh, so if this were a non-COVID universe, we would now 
close the session and walk you over to the Origins Institute where you would meet with the graduate students. But because we live in a two-dimensional world now, uh, we'll have to close this session. So thank you to all the audience members for their attendance and questions, which will be answered. Um, and now we'll uh, close this session and we'll see you with the graduate students in just a few moments. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.